sugar and I get sick. So I just have to let that one go. I can't keep that vow. Um, there are times when, uh, there are definitely times when I covet things. I was joking, uh, I originally started as a monk in the Tibetan tradition and I was joking with one of my Tibetan teachers that I had taken the car that I owned at the time to, to have it repaired and I saw a new shiny car. This beautiful yellow Saturn SUV. And I looked at my teacher and I said, oh, attachment. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. So, um, yeah, it's, but just like, just like, you know, I was describing with becoming a bodhisattva, it's this gradual process. You know, we become monks, but then you're not perfect overnight. It's not like you go through the ritual of becoming a monk and shaving your head and then suddenly, magically, you perfectly live by the vows. You grow into it over time. So the way that I deal with it is I try to see when I'm messing up, and I just go, oh, okay, I need to take a step back and evaluate whether or not the direction that I'm going is really in accordance with the Dharma or not. One thing that people who are not monks and nuns often say to me, uh, of course, in the, in the Vietnamese Buddhist community, there's a lot of respect for monks and nuns, but you know, outside of that, outside of the various Buddhist communities, um, even among practicing Buddhists, converts like myself, people are like, oh, I could never be a monk. It's too restrictive. Well, it's important to remember that the precepts are not a prison cage. The Buddha didn't say, give up things that are good. He said, give up these things because they cause suffering. And so the precept, the thing that I have to constantly remind myself of is that the precepts aren't prison bars. They are lamps on the path to enlightenment. And so when, when I live best in accordance with, with these precepts, that's when I am most at peace. That, that's when I experience the least suffering. So I just remind myself of that, and I slowly bring myself back in line. So uh, another question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the answer. I'm, I'm pretty sure wisdom has a lot to do with how you cope with your uh, challenges. Uh, I truly believe that. And sec second question I have for you is because right now, uh, because you are uh, Caucasian monk, and so for you, how do you see the growth of the prosperity of Buddhism in the United States in, say, next decade or so? What is your view on that? Uh, well, the Dharma is developing very slowly. One of the things that's happening in the convert Buddhist community, that is, which are mostly, not entirely, but mostly white Buddhists like me, um, what's mostly happening, there's a lot of discussion about this divide between the, the immigrant Buddhist community, such as the Vietnamese Buddhist community, and then the English language speaking convert community. And there's on the one hand a recognition that we're missing, that we're missing a lot of knowledge uh, because of the language barrier. And, uh, and we're getting bits and pieces of Buddhism um, in the convert community. Maybe there's one teacher, one American English speaking teacher who went to Asia and studied for many years, and they know the tradition very well, but it's taking a long time for the, the lay Buddhists to really learn it. So, um, and nobody knows what to do about that. Uh, maybe that divide, maybe that split will always be there. I think, I mean, maybe you even see it. The Vietnamese community is the Vietnamese Buddhist community. Then there's the Chinese Buddhist community. And maybe there's some contact and some teaching happening across those lines, maybe not. So that's one of the things that, that's being talked about. Um, I don't know what will happen in the next 10 years. I think in the next 100 years, um, what I hope we will see and what we definitely need uh, is better training and education for Buddhist leaders, both lay leaders, and I think this program that you're participating in, I applaud you for participating in this program. Because it's so easy just to sit back and say, oh, well, I'm Buddhist, I don't have to do anything more about it. You're really trying to do something about it. You're learning. So we need better education for lay Buddhists and for monks and nuns. For um, a lot of American monks and nuns, that is American-born, mostly white, convert monks and nuns like myself, 
were ordained and that there's no opportunity for training and education. Uh, that's why I came to University of the West. I was a monk for several years, I think six, five or six years when I first came to University of the West, and I knew very little. Uh, because the, the Dharma centers, we call them, we don't usually call them temples, are set up um, for lay people who want just a little taste of Dharma. They're not designed to train monks. And that's, uh, I know, uh, I think Venerable, most Venerable Vin Lee wants um, to turn Baofa into a training place for monks because he recognizes that even Dunga and Yupa, they're not designed for educating monks and nuns. It's their parish temples. They're designed for helping to bring the Dharma to lay people. But they need a younger generation of monks and nuns who are really well educated, and really well trained to help bring the Dharma forward. So what I hope we will see and what we absolutely need, both in these immigrant Buddhist communities and in the convert Buddhist communities, is better training for lay Buddhist leaders and for monks and nuns. Thank you for your question. Namo Namo Namo. Namo Namo. Uh, I have a two questions for you. The first, I have uh, my adult children. They grow up here, and they study and work in here, and they lose the very strong way, including the culture and the religion. How we can attract them and put them back to the our traditional and religion? Uh, I second question is, I appreciate your lecture, but uh, in the Sativa, Buddhist Sativa chapter, I like to add two more virtues. The first, uh, the Buddhist Sativa person should have the no individual issue. No individual is mean the whole and the second virtue in the field left, virtue recall the Vietnamese United Buddhist Association President Thich Quang no? We learned that he have two virtues. He never fear the government, and he have a lose it name it for He stand up to against the Vietnamese communist government. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, in relation to the second point, yes, there is so much more to talk about uh, in relation to what it means to be a bodhisattva. And, you know, the one one of those two points you mentioned was fearlessness. Yes, uh, bodhisattvas, having great wisdom, understand that their true nature is not attached to this body. So why should they care what happens to their bodies? That's why they can give up their lives. Because they have, they have no need, they have nothing to fear. If someone kills them, they know that their mind will continue. They'll just be reborn again. And, uh, or choose a form and continue to practice and to teach the Dharma. So you're right, yes, fearlessness. There's so much more, but we're constrained by time. And of course, there's also my limited knowledge. Um, I am not a great Dharma master. I, I'm still very much a beginner. Uh, in terms of the, the younger generation um, who either came here from Vietnam when they're very young or who were born here, um, this is always an issue. In fact, in some of my psychology classes, we've talked about immigrant communities and how there's sometimes, a, maybe conflict isn't the right word, but there's a disconnect between people who came here when they were older uh, and are still culturally and mostly linguistically Vietnamese, in this case, for example, and then their children whose first language is really English, and who like listening to hip hop, and they think Buddhism is just this kind of old dusty thing, you know? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a white guy, so maybe it's, uh, I know you're surprised, right? Uh, no, I'm a white guy, so uh, maybe it's, it's um, not right for me to say this. Maybe, maybe it's uh, a little arrogant for me to say this, but it seems to me, if you want if you want the younger generation to come back to the Dharma, let them come to the Dharma and don't worry so much about traditional Vietnamese culture. Because they're American like me. So let them be American Buddhists, whatever that means. Because even the convert community Buddhists, you know, converts like me, we're still figuring that out. What does it mean to be Buddhist and American? So let them be Buddhists, encourage them in the Dharma, 
but without expecting that they be Vietnamese, culturally Vietnamese Buddhists. That's the best advice that I can give. But again, I recognize I'm saying that looking at this from the outside. So maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Question right here? Yes. Can we open it up? I'm like that. someone who's suffering worse than us, right? You go for a walk in some parts of the Los Angeles area, you see on the street people who are clearly suffering more you know, than, than you are yourselves, right? The thing to do is you can sit in meditation or just sit in a chair when you're lying in bed at night before you go to sleep. Think of those who are suffering more than you and wish that they will find happiness. This is one way you can meditate on compassion. There's a meditation, I mentioned I do this meditation program at UPA. In the spring semester, in the spring term, um, we were doing a meditation called Ponglen. It comes from the Tibetan tradition. It means uh, sending and taking. And what you do in this meditation is you breathe out light, happiness, health, and well-being to others. And you can picture a specific person, or you can picture beings you know, throughout all space and time. So you breathe out light, and then when you breathe in, you are inhaling as like a dark smoke. You're inhaling the suffering of others. Now, of course, you don't have to worry about actually receiving their suffering. This is just a mental exercise. Uh, but you're taking in the suffering of others, and you're breathing out light and happiness and health and well-being to others. That's another way to meditate. But the easiest way is just to think of someone who's suffering worse than you and pray for them. So turn, turn your attention. We suffer because we're always focused on ourselves, our own me, 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 me. So turn your attention away from yourself. Don't, you know, turn your attention away from your own suffering and pray for others. No? Uh, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. I know that the, your time is up. Oh, it's time is up now. Yes, yeah. but we still have a lot of questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, we still have another session after 7 p.m. after the dinner, mm -hmm. the daily briefing, and then could you please stay until okay. that so people can have questions? Please. Uh, I would like to. Let me check with Most Venerable Vin Lee and see if he needs me back at UPOP for the evening services. We have Friday night services. Let me check with uh, Most Venerable Vin Lee. And if he says it's fine, I'm happy to stay and, and answer some more questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, uh, let's stand for the closing prayer. When uh, Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.